Amen. Thank you, Bill and Dave. That was beautiful. Um, my name is Annalise, and I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street, and I have already messed up this morning. I forgot my robe. So when you all sing your first hymn, which you'll do in a minute, I'm going to go put my robe on. That's why I'm about to disappear. But anyway, thank you for being here at Braddock Street this morning. Um, we are a church that strives to be followers of Jesus, loving God in worship, loving others in small groups, and serving the world in mission. I'm one of the pastors. Our other pastor, Kirk, is away doing a wedding this weekend, so we will pray for him for traveling mercies and also for all of that wonderful joy that gets to go with um, celebrating a wedding with folks, so we're thankful for that. Um, if you are a new person, in with us today. Come and meet me after worship outside by the exit. I will be standing there greeting people. Please come say hello. I would love to get to know you and tell you some more about our church and what it is that we do here. If you're a new person and you are joining us online, first of all, good morning to everyone who's online. And um, if you are new, you will find a comment card um, in the Facebook comments that will uh, let you fill it out and get to know us a little better. Let, give us some more information about you as well. Also, if you are online and have a prayer request, you can see the little screen there. We'll tell you how you can send those in virtually. And if you are here with us um, in person and have a prayer request, there are cards in the back in the gathering space. And also, you can use our digital format to send those as well. I'm the only one up here this week, so forgive me if I do not catch them before it is time to do prayers, but I promise they will be added to the list and will be prayed over this week. Okay, would you all please stand and join me in the call to worship? Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Let us pray. Holy God, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Grant us generous hearts and inspire us to love lavishly this day and always. Amen. Now would you all please remain standing and join together in Maker in Whom We Live, the first and last stanzas, and I'm going to go get my robe. My name is Alan Hester, and today's scripture lesson is Romans chapter 13, verses 7 to 8. Pay to all what is due them, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due, owe no one anything 
except to love another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Alan. One of the things that is important to us here at Braddock Street is that you all know where it is that the gifts that you give here go. And so we want to raise up for you one of those awesome uh, missions of our church, which is our early learning center and our preschool. It is an amazing opportunity that we have to give this gift to our community of a safe place where their kids can learn and grow and be cared for um, during the day when parents are at work or doing other things. Um, And it's also a place where we get to be a part of the village that raises those children and letting them know just how loved they are, not only by us, but also by God. So thank you all for making that possible. You guys are awesome. So you will see on our screens ways that you can give digitally, and if you would like to give in person here today with a physical donation, we have baskets in the front and in the back that you are welcome to use. And now let us enjoy this offertory as we worship God through our giving.
clap. Thank you all so much. That was absolutely beautiful. You guys are fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> you spoil us. What an absolute gift. Yeah, we can go home now. That's... <laughs> We're done. That was great. Um, again, my name is Annalise. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street. So glad that you all are with us today. Um, we will be continuing this morning in a sermon series um, called Saving Grace, which is based off of this curriculum um, that gives practical advice about financial well-being. And we are also using this as a way to have our conversation for the year about stewardship. Would you all pr please pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our topic for today is understanding and eliminating debt. Now look, I am in many ways the least qualified person in this room to be giving this sermon. Okay. I am 32 years old, solidly in the center of the millennial generation, and we have more student loan debt than other adults owe on their entire houses. Okay, So, like, <laughs> take that for what it's worth. Um, in order to be ordained in the UMC, which I am not yet, I am currently licensed to be a pastor, I don't have my full ordination yet, but to be able to get there, you have to have a Master's of Divinity degree from an approved seminary, which means that you'll also need a bachelor's degree from an, accreditable, an accredited and reputable college. So I did both of those things, and so did my husband, and many other folks in my generation have equivalent education, but most folks with master's degrees start with a much, much higher salary than folks who are beginning in ministry. So I come by my debt honestly, and I wish God's call came with a guaranteed scholarship. But, oh well, here we are. I am going to try and talk this morning about how to avoid doing exactly the thing that I have already done with my life, because God has a sense of humor. <laughs> In the devotional guide that goes along with this Saving Grace curriculum that we are working through, Reverend Tom Berlin says that there are two main reasons that we end up in debt. One of them is poor financial planning and spending beyond our means unnecessarily. The second one is unforeseen circumstances or emergencies, medical care, or I don't know, global pandemics, maybe. He goes on to say that to deal with option one, we have to let go of our attachments to always wanting more or better things learn to tighten our belts, be more responsible, and do not let the temporary stuff of life become idols to us. And then you create a debt elimination plan, follow it through. I can agree with him on this here, although I guess my student loan debt technically fits into that category, and I don't know how I feel about that. To deal with the second issue, Reverend Berlin's advice is to trust in God. Remember that we have this God who will not leave us or forsake us, and in these moments of emergency, start there <laughs> with this love and trust of God, and then from that point, same thing as before, get that debt elimination plan in place and stick to it, and be sure to put money aside for the next global pandemic or the next bad diagnosis, or the next job loss, or unforeseen whatever it is. In theory, I'm with him here on this one too, and I, I will share with you the debt elimination plan that he has crafted in a moment so that you can see what his idea is, because I think it is pretty good, and if it's something that I have the ability to apply to my life, I think it would be useful for my husband and I to do too. But I do wish that I could ask our friend Reverend Tom a question, which is, what about the people who do not have the resources to follow this plan through? Would this be the same advice that he would sit across dinner table at Monday night dinner and give to the folks that we serve there? I'm not sure that he would, and I kind of hope that he would not, actually. So that being said, uh, this is a plan that will work for some of us, 
but not all of us. And if you are in the camp where this is not you, I understand and I get it. And uh, we have to come up with some different solutions, don't we? But um, for those of us for whom it would work, I do want to show you this plan um, that he has created. Now this comes as a sample from his book. I swear I did not dig into anyone's actual financial history, so if this looks similar to whatever your situation is, it is a coincidence, I promise, okay? Um, <laughs> so you can kind of see what he's done here, um, but I will explain it a little bit further. First of all, you are supposed to list your debts from smallest to largest, disregarding interest. So ignore the interest, just list them smallest debt to largest debt. The second thing, you gotta prepare yourself to tighten your belt and live without frivolities for a little while until you can get the debt wiped out. The third thing is paying down as much as you can on the smallest debt, paying the minimum payments on all of the others as well. And when you have paid off that first one, then you take that amount that you were paying and add it to the next one. And then you continue this pattern until you have paid off all of the debts. This is a plan that could work wonders for some folks here who might be in need of some debt elimination, but again, I want to recognize that there are some folks for whom this plan is not possible to follow because they don't have enough resources to cover the cost of everyday life every day, right? So doing something like this might take some resources that they just don't have available to them. And that brings me back to our scripture lesson for today that Alan read so beautifully for us. Thank you, Alan. I'm going to read it for us again. Pay to all what is due to them, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the love of, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Somewhat easier said than done, right? Um, <laughs> but I do love the concept that our greatest debt that we owe to others is a debt of love. What does that look like when we love lavishly, extravagantly, and with abandon? I want you to take a moment to imagine that love is like currency and you are a billionaire. You can change any person's life that is walking down the street instantly by giving them this gift. And you won't even make a dent in your own bank account doing so, right? That is the way that God's love has been poured out on us. So much love. It is a never-ending stream. We will never run out of places to spend it, and it will never, and we'll never run out of the source of it either, right? God's love has been poured out on us, and it is our job to pour that love back out on other people. There is, of course, a flip side to this, the dark side of humanity, where we have allied ourselves with greed and with hoarding instead of with generosity and thinking of others. So most of you all who have known me for a little while now, if you've gotten to know me, know that I am a Halloween gal, right? For me, this is the most wonderful time of the year. Cool evenings, early sunsets, ghosts and pumpkins and skeletons in your yard, spooky movies on TV, and for me, I'm gonna be sitting there this week with my needle and my thread and my glue gun to make my Halloween costume. Um, just as a side note, my household decided that we're all doing characters from Pokemon this year because the nerdiness knows no bounds in our house. And also because I now get the wonderful joy of living with a one-year-old. Um, she is not mine, not related to me, but our families live together, and she will make the world's cutest Pikachu, I'm just saying. So, spooky season just fills my heart with joy. But I have to give one thing to Christmas, besides the whole Jesus coming here and saving our lives thing, that too, obviously. But the other thing you have to give to Christmas is the movies, right? Christmas movies are great. And so my favorite Christmas movie is this one, Muppet Christmas Carol. 
Now you can argue with me forever and I am never ever going to budge an inch. This is the best version of Christmas Carol and it's also the best Christmas movie. Just putting that out there, okay? I can quote this movie along almost word for word. It's funny, it's poignant, it's beautifully shot and directed and acted. It has great music and of course, puppets, and you can never go wrong with some good Jim Henson puppetry, right? No matter what version of A Christmas Carol is your favorite, because most of us have a favorite of some kind, right? Whether you're a purist who likes to get the book out every year and read it, or maybe you had to have fond memories of gathering around a TV set with whatever version of the movie is your favorite, or maybe you're one of those folks that even likes to listen to like a radio drama version, I like those too, right? No matter what it is, most of us have some kind of connection to this book. If we have read it, it usually becomes a favorite and a Christmas staple for us. Now, I know this is a stewardship sermon, not about Advent, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I promise you this is all relevant. Just stick with me here for a minute, because what I want to do is lift up for you these guys. The Marley Brothers, Robert and Jacob, and yes, You Dickensian purists out there, the original story does only have Scrooge having one partner, not two, but this is perfect casting for this role, and these two cannot possibly be separated, right? They are a pair, and so the decision was made to make this, to split this into two characters, and I stand by it, okay? This scene that they are in is one of those scenes that just, like, defined my faith, As I grew up listening to this story, loving this movie version, this moment is always the one that just like sticks in my head, right? In this scene, the Marleys are explaining that they have spent their life taking advantage of the poor and gaining power by creating cycles of debt that could never be broken. This is the sin of usury, That's not a word that we hear very often in the modern church, but I really think that there are moments when we need to bring it back. In this moment in the story, the Marleys have returned as ghosts to give a warning to Scrooge. They tell him about the consequences of their life exploiting the poor, which is represented by the heavy chains that are attached to their souls. They tell him that they unknowingly forged these chains in life by every act of greed and usury that they had committed, and Scrooge has already forged a pretty good-sized chain for himself. And if he does not listen to the three spirits who are about to visit him, then he too will share in their fate. Pretty spooky, right? It's also pretty convicting, but... It's super clear why this is like my favorite as a Halloween girl, why I love this movie, right? This congregation is filled with generous people. Every week, we are able to lift up to you all the ministries that we as a congregation are able to support because of what you give. We could also lift up things that are usually less thought about, like, you know, the salaries of the staff, keeping all the lights run and the building running. It's so important. Absolutely none of this would be here without you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for your willingness to look out for the well-being of others in your community and around the world. The gifts that you give here save lives every day. You do that. Thank you. It's easy, you know, to decide to live life like the Marleys instead. That's kind of the way that the world expects us to live, right? Greed and selfishness and vanity and pride. All of those things are forces that tell us to care more about ourselves than about other people. But you all have decided that you're not gonna be the folks that add more links to that chain, right? You've decided to live differently and that you are not going to ignore the cry of the needy. Thank you for resisting that temptation to just dive into the Marley lifestyle, to choose to live differently. You are a blessing and there's still more work to be done. 
My prayer for us over the next several years as a congregation is that we will keep expanding our debt. Our finance chair is here and he's, I can like already see the, the, what, we just got rid of it, what are you saying, right? Let me explain, don't freak out. What I am talking about is our love debt, not necessarily our literal monetary debt. I mean our debt to those that are around us. I hope to see our hearts break for the lonely, the hurting, the sick, the poor, those who have been pushed aside and cast out. All of those people are here in this community and we, I hope, feel indebted to them so that we will give of our love and our time and occasionally when it's needed our resources too, right? That we will be able to give to those folks so much love and repay what we owe to society, the love that has been poured out to us to repay it by sharing it with others. I hope that we continue to look for new ways to live life like Scrooge at the end of the story, hearing the chains of greed clink to the ground, feeling the weight of our love debt lift from our hearts as we dedicate more and more of ourselves to reaching out to those who are in need. With God's help, I pray that we can not only continue to feed and clothe people, but start asking the question, why do they keep coming to us in need of food and clothing? How can we stop this from happening to anyone else? And may we be willing to help make changes, maybe to the whole system if we need to, right? We might need to make a change in the pattern so that this won't happen to other people again. Now, I'm not an economist. I'm not well versed in business or financial planning. The only budgets I know how to do are the one for my house and the one for here at work. <laughs> I'm just a dreamer with loads of student loan debt and a heart that breaks for anyone struggling to put food on the table, no matter how they got there. So take these next thoughts for what they're worth. You are always free to disagree with me. I don't actually have a direct line to God, so I can't say that these are words that would come out of God's mouth, but it's what's been put on my heart through my reading of scripture. So for your consideration, I want us to talk about the concept that is found in the Bible of the year of Jubilee. Anyone have heard that before, the year of Jubilee? Got a couple, yeah. I've got some musicians nodding along with me because you might remember the song Days of Elijah. It's got a line in there about, it's the year of Jubilee, right? Yeah, so um, Jubilee is sometimes thrown around in churches to mean something like a celebration or a party, a festival, right? Like to celebrate with like Jubilee, right? Um, but that's not really what it means. It's got a little bit more nuance than that. So if you look to the book of Leviticus chapter 25, that's where you will find the definition of this year of Jubilee. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you because it is super long, so I'm gonna give you cliff notes and I seriously encourage you, if this is an idea that sparks anything in you, go home, pick up a Bible, get on the internet, the Bible's on the internet, you know that, <laughs> and look up Leviticus chapter 25, read through it and see what you think for yourselves. But here's how it works in a shortened version. There's a 49-year cycle where business is business as usual. There are some little cycles inside that of like seven-year things that happen to you, but at the end of this 49-year period, that next year, that 50th year, is the year of Jubilee. And what this means is that all slaves are freed, all debts are wiped out, all fields are allowed a year of rest. Family land that had been sold to cover a debt, well now your family has the right under the rules of Jubilee to go back to whoever it is you sold it to and ask if you can redeem it, buy it back from them. Take a moment to think about what that might look like. A year of Jubilee. All debts erased, all slaves freed, the things that you loved that you had to give away to help cover the costs of life, those things can be bought back, you can get them back again. That's why Jubilee is associated with celebration. 
We don't have a super clear picture of what a Jubilee year would have looked like in actual practice. We're not even really sure if in the time that it was written, this was something that was actually done or if it was just like a, hey, you might wanna consider this. I mean, the scripture is pretty clear, like God said, do this thing, but it, you can imagine, might be real hard to convince a whole society that this is a good idea, right? But for me, when I read about it, I think that it is just a snapshot of the kingdom of God. I have a Catholic friend who always tells me that he wishes the Pope would declare a new year of Jubilee, which is apparently a thing that popes can do, who knew? Um, And uh, he thinks that that would be a really awesome thing and I think that would be pretty cool too. But again, picture this, families not having to choose between life-saving medical treatment or having a home. That's what a year of Jubilee could do. That's pretty amazing, right? No person kept in bondage. Because of course, slavery in this time period that we're talking about was something that could happen to you if you were in deep debt, right? If you owed someone a bunch of money and had absolutely no way to pay it back, they could literally make you a slave. You could work for them and not get wages until your debt is paid off. But here, you're free. That's pretty cool. Even nature gets a chance to rest and be restored. The way that it's worded says that um, you are supposed to, instead of going out and intentionally kind of like planting new things, if there's stuff that's already growing, you can let it grow, but you don't go in and cultivate new stuff. And you can take from the land whatever it gives you, but you're giving it a chance to rest and do its own thing, which is pretty cool. It's like God just declares that there's a year when all of creation gets a break. Everybody, right? And you can almost hear the sigh of relief just rising from every living being, right? Like, thank you, I get a break. It's kind of amazing. I have no idea what would happen if the Pope actually declared a year of Jubilee, and even though we're not Catholic, we all listen to him anyway, right? That would be incredible and would also probably absolutely wreak havoc on our economy. I don't know, again, not an economist, would probably do some damage though. (laughs) But I hope that this concept of this freedom, of this ability to um, have these things erased and let go is something that we as Christians can hold onto in our hearts. How is it that we as people can walk around and declare a jubilee for someone else, right? What can we do to help others or ourselves find that kind of freedom? And again, I'm just a silly, way too in debt millennial, so what do I know? Um, But as a pastor, I hope that we can be people who hold the concept of Jubilee in our hearts. And as you make decisions in the next week or so about how you and your family will support this congregation, I hope that you will think not only about your financial gifts, but that also you will think about your time and about your energy and about your love debt. Thank you for caring about this community. And as you make those considerations, know that God's love is with you no matter what it is that you have the ability to give or not give, you are loved in this place. May we be a congregation that is truly fulfilling the heart of God's law by loving each other and our neighbors without stopping to count the cost. Let us pray. Holy God, we come to you this morning in debt to your love, knowing that without your help, we'll never be able to pay you back for your sacrifice, giving your own life for ours redeeming us, taking us back, calling us your own. We're thankful for that love, for the example of your love that we are able to go out and try to replicate, to be Christians, little Christs, to be ones who spread that kind of love into the world. We're so thankful. God, we know that there are many people in our community and around the world who are hurting today who are in need of an extra measure of your grace and your love. We know that there are people who are having great joy at this moment 
and that they need people to come alongside them to celebrate with them. And folks in between who are just trying to get through the day. And for all of these people we pray. And specifically this morning, God, we have folks that are on our hearts. And so we ask for your presence to be felt especially by Scott Hackett, Harold Ogg, Lucinda Angel, Jim Athern, Steve Lobel, Mary Lou Sprint, Dottie and John Holstein, Bill Arnold, the family of Donnie Oakes, the family of Ann Stein, the family of Patsy Baker, the family of Mitch Hieronymus, the family, sorry, just Rick Kolzowski, for Walter Barr, for Whitey Meadows, Adrian O'Connor, for Clint Nichols' family, for John Allen, Jeff Stefanowitz, Robbie Robinson, Bill Vanskoy, John Goodlow, Mike Ricketts, George Morris, Denny Bromley, Robert Siebert, the Chesley family, Charlie Pinkham, Wendy Harrington, and the family of Thomas, Thomas Leinberg. God, we also pray today for all of those who are victims of COVID-19 and for their families. We pray for all of our healthcare workers and essential services employees, for all of those who are struggling, who have grief, who are struggling with mental health, all of those things, God. We know that there is healing in your arms and ask that you would spread that love um, to us continuously as you do and that we would then pour that love out on others. We pray all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, if you would, please stand as you are able, and we will sing together our closing hymn, Jesus Calls Us, and we are going to sing the first and last stanzas. Thank you all so much for being with us in worship today. Again, if you're a new person, please stop by and see me. I'll be out there by um, the exit to the sanctuary, and I would love to get to know you and answer any questions you might have about our church. Also, as a reminder, next week is, in fact, Commitment Sunday. So if you have not already, go check your mail and get those commitment cards out. If we somehow miss you on our mailing list, please come by the church office. We will gladly give you a copy of those cards. And we ask that you would be in prayer for what those commitments will look like for the following year. Now, here are your benediction. Please, now, go in peace to serve God and... Uh, hold on. Now, go in peace to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do, there it is, may those in this world to whom love is a stranger find in you most generous friends, and may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Mm -hmm.